here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the rain you have been giving us. We thank you for sunshine. We thank you for cooler weathers. We thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for the opportunity that we have in this room to be in fellowship with each other and learn more about you and how to share your love with others. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So I I got a little um, part, part of the issue today other than getting a later start than we normally do um, from home is uh, I tried to get a little fancier with the PowerPoint and that's what caused the difference in the way that it sent to Rick and then that's what caused the reason why Rick couldn't access it and so it it all kind of caught it created a cascade effect we may have recovered the fancier version of the PowerPoint. We'll see, it just has a couple of short videos in it. If it doesn't, I, I prepped for that as well. So um, we wanna talk about this idea. Is Jesus a recycled myth? And um, okay, already my slides are showing a little differently. So hopefully this won't be a problem, but um, what I find with my regular students is probably the same thing that you're going to ex- experience, and that is many of them are completely shocked that this is a claim at all. They've never heard of it. And then others have actually found it, not only they've heard of it, but they found it a compelling argument, like it's actually shaken their faith. And so um, it's a good illustration of why I run my class the way that I do. What I'm trying to do with seniors is inoculate them against these kinds of absurdities so that when they do encounter them, so sometimes they're annoyed with me. They're, they're, they think I'm making up things. Oh, that's stupid. No one would ever say that. No, not only do they say it, you will encounter it. And I don't want you to encounter it later on when you don't have any kind of a safety net or any base knowledge uh, to deal with it. So um, the, the whole idea here is um, can be boiled down to this little Latin phrase post hoc ergo propter hoc. Uh, after this, therefore because of this. And it's bad logic, but it makes some sense to most people. So you know, if, uh, you know, if every single Sunday Keith came in here wearing that shirt and then some Sunday I came in wearing that same shirt, I probably will. <laughs> you, you might conclude that I liked his shirt and went out and yeah. bought that shirt. Would that automatically be true? No. No. Right? Could, have given it to you. could be any number of things, right? There could be a, a dozen different explanations to it. But the fallacy, the logical fallacy, is assuming that if this happened first, it must be the thing that triggered this other, it must be a copy, right? And um, so that's, that's one issue we're gonna take up with this. Um, Why does it have to determine the premise? Yes, the, yes, that's, that's exactly right. I like circular reasoning. In this age of YouTube and TikTok, uh, and I, you know, want I, I think we kind of summarize what TikTok was for anybody who's not familiar uh, naturally. TikTok is this newer video form. It's a short form, very popular with young people, and it is a hotbed of anti-religion, but mostly anti-Christian videos. And what I have tried to explain to my students is that one of the reasons why those videos are so compelling is because they're short. So you have this person who makes this quick hitting, pithy little witty thing that sounds like this big slam or roast on Christianity and then the video is over and then you're just left going, whoa, yeah, that must be true without any critical thinking whatsoever. And what you'll find, this is this is um, this particular argument against Christianity, as as much as any. This may be the top of the list of um, it's accepted by people who will look at Christianity and what they'll say to your face is they don't believe Christianity because they only believe things that have an evidentiary basis, right? You don't have any evidence for your faith, 
I only believe things that have evidence, but then they'll take this claim and they'll just accept it without any critical thinking whatsoever, without any evidence. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's really stark. It's, it's, I can't tell you how many times I've encountered people like that. And there's another one, <coughs> another kind of argument like that, that we, we dealt with earlier in the year, but we're gonna circle back to. I just saw a TikTok video of this week of a girl claiming the reason why Christianity is definitely not true is because the Bible is just copies of copies of copies of copies of copies. And she's, she, she has this look on her face like she's just discovered gold. Like this is, ha ha ha, you stupid Christians, you didn't even know this and I've learned this and now I'm so smart. And it's just like, did you investigate that at all? Or did you just get it from another video person? Cause I know the answer to that question, <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, the idea is that Christianity is just copied from these dying and rising gods from the ancient world. And you may not even know there are dying and rising gods in the pre-Christian ancient world. That's true. Um, there are uh, at least some real similarities if you stretch your imagination a little bit. Uh, I'm going to share a few with you and and I enjoy sharing them with my students because they're kind of salacious and of course that that's appealing to them. I'll be honest with you some of those same ones I, I almost thought I don't know if I want to share that with this group. It's a little oh, why not? Uh, but I'm going to anyway I'm going to anyway but um, you know for example um, Horus is from anybody know what culture? Mm -hmm. Egyptian. Horus is an Egyptian god, and um, Horus's parents were Isis and Osiris. Okay, Osiris had a brother named Set. Set killed Osiris and chopped him into pieces. So if you were ever into mythology, you may have heard this before. Um, Isis resurrected Osiris. So Os Osiris is actually one of the dying and rising gods that Jesus is supposedly a copy of, by the way. Um, resurrected Osiris by finding these pieces and putting him back together. Except for, Except for <laughs> his manhood. And so she fashioned one out of gold. And then supposedly that is how she conceived with Osiris the god Horus. So the claim that Horus was born of a virgin comes from that. And you go, oh, that sounds just like Jesus. <laughs> no, you you know, no, right? It's comic book um, stuff. Yeah, comic book stuff. And, and the reality is <laughs> almost all of these mythologies were even in their day really presented to the people as like, few thought this is a thing in history that had eyewitnesses you know the, the way that we think about Christianity it's just like a it's a really in many ways a completely different kind of thing um, it, it it was how people these die, mo, almost every one of the dying and rising gods that has an actual dying and rising mythology to it the whole purpose of teaching that mythology was to explain to people why things died in the fall and came to life in the spring so every year those gods supposedly, you know, well, mommy, why did the crops die? Because Horus died. Don't worry though, he's gonna rise again in the spring and everything will come back to life. That's, that's literally what those teachings were. And so um, that's largely what we're talking about. <clears throat> so I mentioned, uh, you know, depending on the source, sometimes you'll, you'll see, like if, if you looked this up, you can find videos like uh, one called Religulus, uh, put out by Bill Maher <coughs> or um, Zeitgeist. There, there are these whole fairly famous videos, movie style, well, you know, in length and that kind of thing. Um, and what they what they tend to do is just this sort of um, dump kind of process. Uh, in other words, they don't spend any time trying to make the case that there's actual similarities. They just give you this long list of uh, other gods that supposedly are just like Jesus. And, and the psychology of that is because the list is long or because their li list of claims is long, 
that you'll just be so overwhelmed by it that you won't think critically about it at all. That's one of the hallmarks yeah. of lying. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so the, the two biggies, though, are Horus and Mithra or Mithras. And we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit more time on those. Uh, but you, believe it or not, I mean, you know, most of you are probably at least mildly familiar with Hercules. Mm -hmm. you know, did you ever look at Hercules and go, that's just like Jesus? Um, they're, they're, he's on the list. Um, Buddha, Krishna. Um, so these claims are really easily debunked. It's not, it's not hard. Um, what I do in my classes is I actually go to the library and I grab every book on mythology I can find. I don't, I don't check through them to see if they say what I want them to say. I just grab all the mythology books and I bring them into class and then they get assigned a god. All right, find out how similar to Jesus Horus is and Mithras and Hercules and Dionysus and uh, Attis and, and so on and so on, okay? Um, and then they do their little research and they, they start, you know, during the process they come to me and they say, Mr. Grecki, I'm having a problem. What's the problem? I'm not finding any similarities. And I go, huh, that's weird. I wonder why that is. You know, and the reality is, if you and so what I'm what I'm giving them, the one thing that I am parsing out when I do that is the difference between quality sources and not quality sources, right? So um, I don't expect anybody to research this on a primary source level. You you can't read in those languages anyway, right? But historians who have legit credentials have researched these gods and what was taught about them in their actual day, and they've written based on that information. And those, there you find almost no similarities. Um, it's, it's on the internet that you find all the, the big claims. Um, but there are other things. Like I said, there are some, you know, for example, almost every fake god who's ever been in existence has claimed to have been born of a virgin. So there's a similarity that you could say is a legit similarity. And if you wanted to say Christianity copied that from other religions, I don't actually have a good way to debunk that claim. Because I don't have, as we talked about earlier in the year, I can't prove a virgin birth. Can't do it. Can't prove somebody didn't have sex from 2,000 years ago. It, it, you know, so... Um, if someone wanted to make that claim, I would just say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue that point with you. I have other ways I would explain to you why I think it's reasonable to believe Jesus really had a virgin birth, and, it, and it, of course that starts with the resurrection, and then you work your way back. If you have real evidence for an actual resurrection, then the other teachings about Jesus are reasonable beliefs to have, even though you don't have evidence in the same way for a virgin birth. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> here is, yeah, here's my, well, we'll see what happens. I don't think this will play, but if it does, great. No evidence. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we'll have sound. That will be one of the twists. Just kind of an experiment today, I guess. Oh, didn't play. Okay. So. What I did, though, is I screenshotted some of the video. So that's what this is. Uh, that's why it looks like a video, but it's not. So Mithra, or Mithras, um, born of a virgin, supposedly, born on December 25th. That's a popular one. Twelve disciples performed miracles, uh, dead for three days and, and risen from the dead. Dionysus. Um, what you, if you know anything about Greek mythology, you know that Greeks and Romans sort of borrowed each other's gods. Romans mostly got, borrowed Greek mythology and they just made up new names. So you'll see Dionysus or Bacchus, same god. Um, anybody know what Dionysus is the god of? The sea, I would guess, from the anchor. It, that's a good guess. That's supposed to look like a cross, which is interesting mm -hmm. because that's not... There's some, there's some bigger issues. He's the god of wine, which, by the way, most students say, oh, there's a real similarity. Jesus yeah. changed water into wine. Um, <clears throat> Krishna, born of a virgin. That's one of my favorite claims, by the way, the claim that Krishna was born of a virgin. Now, of course, we would say all of these are just mythology. So, you know, whatever claims they want to make, whatever, I, I'm going to talk about them more at least for our purposes, kind of on the same level. Here's, all right, was Krishna actually born of a virgin? 
Well, the actual teachings don't even sit claim that he was born of a virgin. He was the seventh child of his parents. Um, and there's no claims that you know they were all virgin born either. Addis has a particularly interesting dying and rising mythology that uh, you'll find entertaining. Um, but supposedly born of a virgin, born on December 25th. The December 25th one is probably one of the, the more legit true similarities and yet also <laughs> one of the most ridiculous ones. Okay. Yeah, I mean, how can they all be <coughs> born on December 25th? Oh, no, it's okay, that's, that's one question. Okay, was Jesus born on t December 25th no, no, would, be a, would so. be a question worth asking, no. right? Yeah, Horus born on December 25th. Does anybody know what happens around December 25th? Uh, solstice. Solstice, right? Uh, so there were a lot of pagan ritualistic practices around the winter solstice. And I think you can make a case, I've heard this argued against, but I'm actually pretty comfortable saying that the early Christian church saying, hey, let's commemorate Jesus' birthday, co-opted that date to sort of pull, you know, sort of trump the pagan mythologies. Hey, you're gonna, you wanna worship something on those days, let's, let's just take over the date. I think that's probably what happened. I think there's yeah. decent evidence for for that. Um, it's you know not. When the date was picked. Like when did Christians decide? We're gonna I don't know it? when. It, yeah. It's during Gnosticism, and so the Gnostics believed that Jesus wasn't God; right. he was just spirit. And Christmas teaches God coming into the flesh, which is totally anti-Gnostic. Yeah. And then you have the great Roman celebrations around the 25th with all their drinking and. And like in early America, it was a time of Christmas Day. Was a time of you blew up in your neighbors' mailboxes, things like that. Uh, that's how we celebrated Christmas in our country originally. And the Romans did things. Like so if it was inspired by a pushing back on the Gnostics, you'd be talking about somewhere yeah. between so one hundred and two fifty. And then you pick the event that countered, you know. So because Christians didn't go around blowing up neighbors' mailboxes, I don't think. <laughs> I'm going to ask my instructor. I, I found no evidence that it was always considered godly to go around. Do you remember last week when you patted yourself on the back for not saying such obnoxious things? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> All right. So problem number one with this claim uh, is the, the, the similarities that are claimed are usually fictional. Like that not, I don't just mean the, the, the mythologies are fictional. I mean the actual, even if you take if you learn about the actual teachings of that religion and then try to make the connections, they actually don't exist. They're, they're more often than not just made up out of whole cloth. So I mentioned Krishna, Krishna seventh child of his parents. Um, the religious video, uh, one of the claims is that it, his father was a carpenter. Um, look through... Find yourself a dozen books on Krishna and find any reference to the... And so why they make them up? I mean, I think we know why they make them up, right? I mean, it, it, all of this is an attempt to undermine Christianity. And those Christianity. movies are, I mean, they're still referenced. The Zeitgeist is about 15, 20 years old yeah. at this mm -hmm. point. But it's, yeah. I mean, that, it's brought up all the time yeah. in the discussions I have yeah. As, yeah. as fact. Right. I mean, that's almost, I don't want to say it's their Bible, but I mean, they quote from the movie, well, this, this, and this, and it's always like the mic drop, you know, like, yeah, and and so hopefully this will help. Addis is conceived depending uh, depending on the mythology. Okay, conceived of a pomegranate or an almond, um, and the the sacrifice for the world was castrating himself, and then the resurrection was the blood from that castration uh, caused a tree to grow, a pine tree to grow. That's that's supposedly how we copied. That, that's how we came up with Christianity is we looked at that mythology of Addis and said, you know, it'd be great. Let's make our own religion like that. Okay. Horus, I mentioned uh, his story. Buddha, supposedly born of a virgin because he was conceived of his mother having a dream about a white elephant. Dionysus uh, is uh, not going to shock you, if, again, if you know anything about Greek mythology. Dionysus is the product of one of Zeus's many trysts. And then um, the goddess, uh, I think Hera, if I have this right, um, in her jealousy did something that led to the death of Dionysus' mother. 
Zeus then has to sew Dionysus into his thigh in order to bring him to term. That's the claim that Dionysus is born of a virgin, even though actually it's literally the opposite of a virgin birth, in the, in, you know, in, even in the written mythology. So uh, Mithras is one of the funnier ones in terms of born of a virgin because the, the mythology teaches that he was born from a rock, which I suppose technically would be a virgin, I hope. Um, <laughs> Last Supper or Lord's Supper is, uh, there's a teaching about him feasting on a bull. We'll come back to that one. Um, this, is, this, is, um, this is a unique one because there are, in a form of Mithraism, legit simil like enough similarities to Christianity that would make you pause. But here's the actual investigate it and what you'll find is a version like Mithraism started in Persia uh, about 600 years before Jesus and then it gets basically migrated into the Roman world by you know the Roman soldiers moving all over these regions and then bringing things of culture back and then Mithraism starts to copy Christianity you start to get Sunday worship. You start to get claims of like died for the sins of the world. Every one of those things that you can find any documentation of postdates Christianity. Comes you know fifty to seventy five years after the actual events of the resurrection, and so um, that's an interesting one. It's a unique one. Problem number two: virtually every claim, like the ones uh, that we've mentioned here, has competing mythologies. So you know. It's, that's not the strongest argument against all this, but I think it's even by itself would be a reason to go, you don't even know what the teachings were about those gods. What, where are you going with this? Um, and of course the people who make the claim don't care about that. Um, but if I were talking to somebody who thinks they know something about this, that's probably a game I would play with them. Oh, really? Like was he conceived of a pomegranate or an almond? Which was that, you know? <laughs> Or, you know, it's just weird, uh, weird part of this. Um, problem number three is that while there is a mountain of evidence for the actual resurrection of Jesus, um, you know, we could spend weeks on that if we wanted to, and, and we can come back to that and do that. We spent a couple of Sundays on it. Um, there's, these were never presented in that way. They were, they were never, it's not even like you could say, well, okay, Christianity is a mythology, and yeah, they claim eyewitness testimony, and there, there's some corroborating evidence that seems to be compelling, but uh, this one does that too. Well, that's not the case. There's not even an attempt in, in those other religions to present the, 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 the claims as real history. Problem number four, uh, with only a few exceptions, um, First century Jews wouldn't have even known about most of these. There'd be a few that they probably would have. You know, Jerusalem was kind of a hub of a lot of activity, um, but it's, it's really funny. Like if you watch these videos to their completion, or, or if you watch Zeitgeist, they have, they'll, they'll give you a list that scrolls on the screen too fast for you to read. And, uh, but if you slow it down, you'll find references to gods in other places of the world that weren't known to the people of Jesus's area until a thousand to two thousand years later. Like some, in some cases, like only recently have we understood, like Quetzalcoatl, you know, from Mesoamerica. Did, did the Christians copy Quetzalcoatl? No. Are there actual similarities? No. Do you find claims in these videos that we copied that one? Yes, it's, it's really way out there. And again, it's stuff like that that makes some people think that what I'm doing here is I'm making up something that nobody really argues this, but they do. Problem five, some of the claims are entirely superficial. We mentioned December 25th. Um, if somebody brings up the December 25th, I say, well, the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus was born on December 25th anyway. so. What are you doing with that? What you know, if that's if the idea is that's supposed to be another evidence that the Christians who made up Christianity, right, the people who wrote down the Bible, were copying these things, then 
then why is that not in the Bible? But the bigger issue is we're not even really claiming that Jesus was born on that date. And, and I'm willing to concede that we probably did co-opt that date. I don't have a problem with that. Um, problem number six, this, I, this fallacy, right? Just the, even if you had real similarities. So if you had the dying and rising thing or the virgin birth thing, um, you, you can't conclude just from that that, that we copied it. Um, I will say, though, that I, I think there... I wouldn't, I wouldn't use this as a primary argument, right? I wouldn't walk up to somebody who's, who thinks this is true and go, oh, pff, well, just because Jesus came later doesn't mean that he, we copied that. that I, think, I think that if you're already sort of skeptical or maybe you're even a Christian and you don't like some of the theology of Christianity and you're kind of looking for it, that's what I find the most, by the way, is that there are people who are raised not very... No, their Christian upbringing isn't properly gospel focused. It isn't doesn't contain any real foundation for how to stay strong in the faith. And then they come up against things like abortion and sexuality and things like that. And they they start to see Christians as judgmental and hypocritical. And then what they want is a is a conscious a conscience free reason to reject Christianity. And so what they do is they find something like this and they and they say, ah, it's all made up anyway. And then they walk away and then they've got something that they can tell their loved ones is the reason why they've rejected Christianity, even though the real reason is the sin stuff, right? Uh, that's super common. Uh, so again, I, I think that if there were real similarities, I think there would be reason to say, let's, let's sit down and, and think about about that. I wouldn't blow it off. Next problem, uh, first century Jews have no motive to <coughs> dump their actual religion. So one of the, to me, this is one of the more powerful arguments against this. Um, when we think about the history of the Israelites, they did actually have a kind of a history of bringing in these false gods, right? You could say, well, go back into Old Testament times. That's what got them into the most trouble most of the time. Yeah. Right. Um, the question, though, is: Is that is, is there any historical evidence that that's the the ongoing problem in the time of Jesus? And I would argue, absolutely not. In fact, the opposite was happening. What had happened by the time Jesus came along is that you have these competing groups of Pharisees and Sadducees and Essenes, all competing to show they were the most orthodox, right-worshipping group of Jews, right? So you have an era, that's one of the, when you read the Bible and it says Jesus came at just the right time, I think that's true in dozens of ways. Like if you ever asked, you know, my students would say, well, why didn't, if Jesus came now, it would be somehow better. You know, we'd have video evidence or something like that, right? And there are lots of reasons. We talked about a couple of these before, right? For one thing, we wouldn't execute Jesus for blasphemy, and he needed to die for the sins of the world. Um, if he came earlier, you wouldn't have the, the ad, uh, advantage of, of all the Roman roads and all the ways that the gospel was able to be spread after that. Um, one of the things that's also true is that if Jesus had come earlier, right in the heart of a time when uh, the people of Israel were, you know, grabbing different religious practices to kind of, you know, uh, warp Judaism, this would have a completely different feel than it does. Um, but the reality is, there isn't any good reason to think that, that that time period of Jewish people would have said, you know, it's a really good idea, let's tick off Yahweh by, you know, pulling in all these pagan gods and then calling Jesus God. There's that, that's, a, that's a weird claim to make. Um, now, I get, by the way, why a lot of people wouldn't think that's a strong argument. I, I do. It's one of the things that I think is really compelling. I don't know if a skeptic would find that terribly compelling. Um, if, you really, if you were having this conversation with a loved one or somebody who you're actually having ongoing conversations with, that might be a useful thing to bring up. 
Problem number eight, if Christianity were merely an amalgam of pagan mythologies, uh, that would have only served to make it more relatable to the Greco-Roman world. Um, so if you think about that, right? So uh, if you know anything about early history here, um, in the Roman world, the, the biggest problem that Christians were having is that they refused to worship these pagan deities. That was the conflict. If they would just bow down to these other pagan gods, they would be allowed to, to call Jesus one of their gods. That would not have been a big deal. The biggest problem that was causing persecution for them is the exclusivity of Christianity. So the idea that Christians really just kind of cobbled together a religion that was a grouping of all these things that the Romans wanted them to worship anyway, and that that explains Christianity, it's, it's, it's actually pretty absurd. Um, that would have made Christianity um, popular and legal in the Roman world, not illegal in the Roman world. Uh, problem number five, nine. I don't know why I said that was five. Um, the, uh, none of these alleged similarities does anything to erase the historical evidence. <coughs> so if, if, you've, if you wanted to say, hey, today's class was interesting, uh, I don't see myself ever talking to somebody about it, but if I wanted to be ready with some kind of a response, the reality is that the actual evidence of the resurrection is still really the best argument. Um, what I would say to me to somebody is, if you think there are real similarities, show me the similarities, number one, and I'm going to point out pretty easily those aren't real similarities, uh, or show me some evidence that that was really what was taught about that God. And then the second thing would be, all right, how do you explain, for example, Christianity going from here's this wandering preacher who is, according to you, just a wandering preacher, didn't do any miracles, wouldn't have been anything other than maybe a dynamic teacher, gets executed, and then out of that claim that he rose from the dead, it explodes into this worldwide religion in the face of all this persecution. Explain the evidence for those kinds of things. Explain the early eyewitness testimony. Tell me what, you know. So you, you could approach it that way, um, in my opinion. Um, so what's really going on here, I mentioned a lot of this already when we were just kind of riffing at the beginning. Um, there is a vague similarity on some of those things, so that's part of it, the virgin birth thing, for example. Um, the, the dying and rising thing, kind of. Um, I don't know why I left my ringer on, probably because my daughter and my wife started off on a 2,000 mile journey this morning. but. I'm still going to turn it to a different tone there. Um, so there is that vague similarity. Um, we mentioned this growing seasons thing. Um, one of the biggest things that you'll find in this is um, the teachings that are known about these so-called gods are so vague that that is actually what hatches some of this, okay? So, so Mithraism, for example, if you look up Mithraism, what you'll find immediately is its category is mystery religion or mystery cult. Because at the time that it was actually being practiced, it was even done in a secret fashion. And so what historians find is they're very frustrated it, to find actual information about these <coughs> religions because they were actually practiced as secrets to begin with. And so what that creates is a void, which allows anybody with you know a computer to make up and fill in the gaps. Um, and so that's a huge, huge part of it for sure. Um, I mentioned a lot of them are, are completely made up. In the case of Horus, that's an easy one because it's actually well known amongst Egyptologists. This guy named Gerald Massey, basically trying to make a name for himself, created all of these, like literally one of the claims is that Horus was baptized by Anup the baptizer. And you go, oh, wow, that sounds, really similar 
you know, a specific baptizing figure in the mythology, and you go, wow, I guess maybe we did make that one up, you know. And then you find out, no, actually there's no written documentation of any such figure anywhere in the mythology. It doesn't exist. He made it up. Um, but again, the people who believe this stuff don't, they don't investigate that. They don't, they don't know about Gerald Massey. It just gets repeated and repeated and repeated and, and lives forever on the internet. Um, another way that this sort of pops up is from artwork. So if you find like a really common thing is for there to be almost no written documentation, but most of what we think we know about the religion is gleaned <coughs> from images. So uh, uh, like one of the videos that I've mentioned, I don't remember which one it is, I think it's the Zeitgeist one, you have a picture of a, a supposed deity on the lap of an adult with attendees or worshipers standing in front. Okay, So what do you think is claimed from that artwork? What's that supposed to be just like? Well, that's go Mary ahead. And the Virgin. Okay. Mary yep. Mar Mary, Mary, and Jesus. Yeah. Who's out here? Disciples. The Magi. Okay. Oh. Now, you might say, "Well, why is that any different than the disciples?" Because it's a little bit more specific, right? If I claim it's it's a visit from the Magi it has that greater level of, oh, you know, disciples is a more general idea, but that guy was visited by the Magi? Well, no, there's no teaching about anything like that in the religion, but there's this image and then this interpretation that's, that's put on it. Um, the most common one is when you see any kind of supposed God with his hands outstretched, which is supposed to look like crucifixion, crucifixion right? It's even, it even has a name. If you see someone with their hands outstretched, it's called standing in cruciform. Now, never mind that the gods that this is claimed that we that we copied the re, the, the crucifixion from them were worshipped at a time when actual crucifixions were not a thing, right? Actual crucifixions come up a thousand years later in the Roman world. But the idea that this, this God with his hands outstretched, which could mean a thousand different things, right? There's no cross involved in, these, in this artwork. There's just the hands outstretched. There's no stigmata. There's no, there's no other reason other than hands outstretched to call it something like a crucifixion. But that's, that's what you'll find if you watch these videos. Um, sometimes the claims are made off of just playing with a jargon. Okay, so I mentioned that Mithra had a meal in the mythology. Do you remember? He feasted on a bull. Okay, so all I have to do to make that sound like it's Christianity copied it is call it the Lord's Supper, right? Uh, or you'll have some of these religions that will have some kind of a washing, something like that, right? All I have to call that is baptism. baptism. And if I use those words, suddenly it sounds like there's this, this actual similarity when the similarity <coughs> is super superficial, right? Um, that's, that's a big part of it. That's pretty common. Uh, in the case of Mithraism, well, with jar, you're one, you're am, one am I off? Yeah. All right, sorry. Go. No. This is my blood? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, no other similarities. Although, again, in the case of Mithraism, you did have some of those things did start to get claimed later. That was the one that, that both predates and postdates Christianity. Um, and so um, I can't say definitively that they didn't start tacking those things on. The, the original teachings about Mithra were super, super limited, very secretive. The rock thing can d dates back to Persia. Uh, and the, the, the bull thing, um, 
As far as I know, the only documentation actually is more around the time of Christianity, but that teaching may have, have started before that. So I mentioned that. Um, now, um, I'm going to see what happens here because with Isaiah logged in, this, this could potentially work in a different way. But um, I may have mentioned one time before um, Lutheran satire. Lutheran satire is worth checking out if, you, if, you, if you're ever on YouTube. If you're a YouTuber, check out Lutheran satire. Um, lots of really good stuff there um, done in a very snarky fashion. So if you don't like sarcasm and satire, don't go there. Um, and um, when I first started watching their videos, I, I sometimes would think, ah, I, don't, I don't know if this is the best way to, to handle this because it's so mocking. Um, and yet there's a place for it, I, I think I've come to, to decide. So um, I, I, we'll see what happens if I click on this, but I have a quote from it that I'll share with you if it doesn't work. So last year, I paid nothing for electricity, and I actually made money by using a... Probably get in trouble with YouTube for this. Well, thanks to all of you for coming out to our service this morning, and I pray that the rest of this Christmas Day is wonderful for each and every one of you. In fact, I just decided what I'm going to do, because I know what will happen. If I show that, YouTube will take down our video from today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to I'm going to finish what we're doing and then I, we'll shut down the the video and I'll show you after ten o'clock I'll show that video to you okay because I, I I'm it's somebody else's content so what's going to happen now is this video will end up inside our video and they have ways of, of seeing that and yeah. that happen you know you can get around that a song or something yeah that happened with a song we sang in church once yeah. So hold that thought. We'll come back to that. Anybody who's watching at home, there's the link for that. Because during the sermon, the congregation sang the song. Let me advance. I noticed that, and we that artist that created that cartoon that reminds so me of the right one on uh, the Trinity that we yes. that Toby showed here years ago. And yes. And did some clipping on it. Yep, yep. It's the same, it's the same site. The... I, in fact, I've, I'm sure I've shared with you some some videos uh, of theirs. Uh, does anybody remember the Mary, 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 and Mary video? Mm, yeah. Maybe on your own. Maybe maybe I didn't send that one out. Okay, so one of the one of their videos is um, Paul supposedly speaking to Peter, and and uh, one of them says, I think Paul says to to Peter. I got an idea how we can make our fake religion conspiracy even better. We're going to change some of the names of our female characters. And uh, so Peter says, "Well, what are we? You know, what are we going to call? You know, Susie?" And and Paul says, "Mary." And they're like, "Okay, well, what are we going to call? You know, the wife of Cleopas?" And Paul goes, "Mary." And then he and then he, he's like, so we're, at least we're going to keep calling Jesus's mother Hannah, right? He's no, we're going to change her name too. What are we going to change it to? Mary. Mary, you know, you know, Susanna Magdalene. You know, what are we going to call her? Mary, and you know, they go through this whole thing, and 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 then Peter says, well, you know, the only reason to call seventy-five percent of your characters the same name is if you're telling a true story. And Paul says, yeah, th th that's how we'll trick people. You know, people think it's so ridiculous, it must be true. And, and, and it's, it's kind of, it's, it, it's, it's silly, but it's also kind of interesting, right? Like, if, if Christianity is fake, why is it that almost all of the women in the text are named Mary? It's, it's a, 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 at best lack of imagination. Um, but much more likely to just it's just reality it's just and then and the reason why I thought maybe I had shared it with you before was because I thought we had done a lesson on 
um, the common people names of the day. Is that ringing a bell now, right? Yeah. Okay. And what we know from historical sources is that Mary was, in fact, the most common female name of the area of Palestine in the first century. Which is why some of the agnostic books didn't get put in, right? Right. And so the, the apocryphal books, the yeah, fake gospels, yeah. do a really horrible job on those, those names. And so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Okay, so anyway... Uh, for, for folks at home, uh, I know there have been a couple of people who, who have been watching at home. So um, this is, to me, the key line from the video I'm, I'm going to show you after we stop the feed today. Um, the, the Horus character, so there's this cartoon Horus in the, in the video. And uh, he says, I, I don't understand. If, if all of these claims were made up without any textual evidence, why do people make these claims as if they're true? And the pastor says, well, I suppose it is strange that people who claim that they won't believe without anything without anything without demonstrable evidence will believe anything without demonstrable evidence <laughs> as long as that thing can be used to mock the gospel uh, to me that is that is a good summary of 50 percent of the things we're covering in this class it's just reality um, over and over and over and over and over and over again now you you could be tempted from that to just dismiss all of the skeptics that way right Oh, well, you know, they're just so eager to dismiss Christianity. Why should I even try? And hopefully, and I know that some of you have even voiced some of that perspective. Um, it should be fairly obvious by now. That's not my perspective. That's not what I'm trying to teach. Um, I think um, our loved ones are being inundated by this kind of stuff. And uh, if you have... You, know, you may have kids, grandkids, great grandkids who are this is this is the world they're growing up in is to be fed a perspective that, oh, well, you know, you know, you're, you're bothered by your bigoted mom or your homophobic dad or your judgmental pastor. It's OK. It's all just a big, stupid mythology anyway. Don't you know their Bible is just a copy of 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 a copy, of a copy <laughs> and all of it was copied from these other ancient mythologies. Did you know that Horus died and rose again for the sins of the world, born of a virgin on December 25th? No, I didn't know all that. Wow, all these years I was deluded into believing in Christianity like I believed in Santa Claus, but now my eyes have been opened. <laughs> right? This is, this is reality. This is what's happening. And it's, it's, it's a major contributor to why Christianity will continue, barring God's miraculous intervention, is going to continue to decline in, in the United States. Because we're in conflict with the culture on sin, and the, the prevalence of things like YouTube and TikTok allow for all these ridiculous attacks on Christianity to go unchecked. And the combination of those two is just really rapidly, rapidly hastening the, the post-Christian nature of the United States. So, All right. Unusually, we have some time here. Comments, questions? Well, I'm, I, I couldn't uh, help but be struck by the similarities between uh, the connections, really, between last week's uh, discussion on Mormonism and so forth and this week's, so, you know, in a kind of a backhanded way, you know, just the, all the uh, comments, the, the attacks, you know, uh, on Christianity being copied from ancient cultures. Well, the same thing's going on today in reverse. You know, we're mm -hmm. talking about Mormonism, which heavily bars from Christianity. Yeah. And uh, so you can see the wheel has been flipped. You know, yeah. the, the truth is still there. Yeah. It's interesting to think about, you know, post-Christian religions and what what the motives are. The, the motives are all very interesting to me. So, like, for example, when I think about the beginning of Christianity and you ask, all right, if somebody was faking Christianity, what were they trying to accomplish? What was the goal? And, of course, modern people think, well, they got famous and they got rich, right? Look at, you know, the, the Catholic Church has $6 billion in reserve or whatever. Um, but that's, that's, that's wrong thinking, right? That's not Christianity at, at the beginning. The beginning, the only thing you could have hoped to have gotten out of 
creating a fake religion of Christianity is total persecution. And there's no reason to think historically, from but what we know historically, that you could have expected anything other than to be the next person up on that cross. So what, what, what motivated it? Now fast forward to Islam or Mormonism or whatever, and you get to a point where now Christianity has this major hold in the world. It does have power. It does have... They're, they're, you know, look at today. Look at how many people, televangelists out there, have used Christianity as a essentially a ruse to make themselves wealthy, right? So, what motivates somebody like Joseph Smith or Muhammad to just basically jump on the back of Christianity, make it seem enough like Christianity to be appealing to that crowd, right? but twisted enough to make it so that you're the sole gatekeeper of truth, right? And that's exactly what you have in those things. Yeah. Yeah. Why would they do that? So why? For their own power, right? So if you go back, yeah, I mean, think about, you know, Joseph Smith's the easiest, well, really Muhammad too. So what, you know, what they got out of it is the same thing that stereotypically men have always wanted out of anything, power and sex. Right. So, you know, what did what did their their standing in these new fake religions get them? Freedom to have sex with as many women as as possible, which, by the way, is to me is another argument in favor of the truth of Christianity. If you think, you know, if you think about it, that's that's a fairly weird thing that Christianity teaches the sexual ethics that it does. One man, one woman for life, not men have sex with whoever you want. And it's it's. It's oddly one of the only religions in the world that started that way, which to me just sounds like it must be true. So, and obviously, Mormonism started out not that way, but it has right. migrated to that. Do you think just to, to become more acceptable to the masses? Type migrated to be more state. like Christianity <laughs> oh, yes. and pushing well, away from the poly well, yeah, polygamy and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So they could become yeah, so if you, if you tr track the history, what, ha what happened once Mormonism started the way that it did is that those, those practices and other practices that were pretty out there did lead to actual persecution of Mormons. So the Mormons get kicked from New York to you know, the Midwest to all the, and they just keep moving to avoid persecution. And in the process, in order to gain acceptability over the years, they've stripped down things like the, the racism and all that kind of yeah. stuff. And yeah, in order for Utah to become a state, they had to kind of strip away a lot of the, a lot of the most extreme teaching. So yeah, just to become more acceptable in the mainstream culture. Uh, you made me. You made me say some things about Mormonism today that were more. That sounded more mocking after I spent a whole hour last week <laughs> trying to be loving and respectful. <laughs> it's your fault. No. I wonder if there's a board game out there someplace. Create your own religion. <laughs> yeah, that that it, 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 that there probably is somewhere actually. And if there's not, you may you may have just found a way to get rich. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and close things out, and then I'll show everybody here the other video. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for Jesus coming into actual history, taking on human flesh, doing his miracles and living his life uh, around real people in history who you inspired to report all these important events, including his actual death and his actual resurrection. We thank you for the way that you um, moved people to be brave enough in the face of persecution to continue to spread that good news that you have actually reached down in history to solve our sin problem. We ask that you um, miraculously uh, thwart the efforts of people who are trying to mock you and mock your truth and help us to be uh, a part of your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we'll turn this off. I'm going to trust that, actually I'll turn this on.